Hi. Two days in a row. This is Mike Bevel. You're watching Footnotes. We're reading Middlemarch. Um, a chapter when I feel like it. I said a chapter a day. That turned out to be a lie. So, but this is two days in a row, so maybe it's the start of a trend. I don't know, but let's just jump in. This is a pretty short chapter. We've made it to book two. Book two is called Old and Young. Hmm, who do we know in the book that is old and young? Dorothy and Kazapan, but I don't think it's gonna be about them. We're still in the part of Middle Parts that I've read. Um, I've never finished the book. I've gotten nowhere near finishing the book. But this is, uh, we're making progress. We're up to chapter 13, which opens with uh, a quotation just from George Eliot. Um, she wrote, she, she wrote some of her own little epigraphs as if they, epigrams, we never have solved that, have we? We never will. Some things need a mystery. First gentlemen, how class you man, as better than most, or seeming better, worse beneath that cloak, a saint or knave, pilgrim or hypocrite? Second gentleman, nay, tell me how you class your wealth of books, that drifted relics of old time. As well, sort them at once by size and livery. Vellum, tall copies, and the common calf will hardly cover more diversity than all your labels cunningly devise to class your unread authors. So that, I really read that badly, and I'll tell you why, because I think it's iambic pentameter. I am not a Shakespearean actor. I like some Shakespeare. I don't like all the Shakespeare. I especially don't enjoy the, we're twins separated at birth and no one recognizes us and all that nonsense. I saw a production once of King Lear um, where, there are just a lot of choices that went into it that um, didn't work in the play's favor. They set it during the Ice Age and um, I don't know, just, and then things just got worse after that. Also, uh, my friend Teresa and I uh, saw it in Portland, Oregon, and the director I think had a penchant for male pattern baldness because most of the men on stage uh, had that, which was readily about readily, which was very uh, apparent, readily apparent is what I was trying to say, uh, sitting up in the uh, balcony where we were because you could just look down. And then I thought, well, maybe we're supposed to read, like, is there a, is there a code? Is it like Morse code? Are they arranged? Uh, to say something to the audience that we're not getting? I don't know, probably not. It's fine. I like King Lear a lot. Let's try it again in iambic pentameter. How class you man is better than the most, or seeming better worse beneath that cloak, a saint or knave, pilgrim or hypocrite. Second gentleman, keep your elbows off the table, Mike. Nay, tell me how you class your wealth of books, the drifted relics of all time as well. Sort them at once by size and livery. Vellum, tall copies, and the common calf will hardly cover more diversity than all your labels cunningly devised to class your unread authors. All right. Um, once again, I am left baffled by what George Eliot intends us to do with these. Do they... Do we use them as a hint? Does it tell us sort of what to expect in the chapter? Did she feel she needed it? I don't know. We can't ask her because she's dead. No one blamed you. In consequence of what he had heard from Fred, Mr. Vincey determined to speak with Mr. Bulstrode in his private room at the bank at half past one, when he was usually free from other callers. But a visitor had come in at one o'clock and Mr. Bolstrode had so much to say to him that there was little chance of the interview being over in half an hour. 
The banker's speech was fluent, but it was also copious, and he used up an appreciable amount of time in brief meditative pauses. Do not imagine his sickly aspect to have been of the yellow, black-haired sort. He had a pale, blonde skin, thin, gray, besprinkled brown hair, light gray eyes, and a large forehead. We would call it a five head. Loud men called his subdued tone an undertone and sometimes implied that it was inconsistent with openness, though there seems to be no reason why a loud man should not be given to concealment of anything except his own voice. And thus it can be shown that Holy Writ has placed the seat of candor in the loudness. Mr. Bolstrode had also a deferential bending attitude in listening and an apparently fixed attentiveness in his eyes which made those persons who thought themselves worth hearing infer that he was seeking the utmost improvement from their discourse. Others, who expected to make no great figure, disliked this kind of moral lantern turned on, turned on them. If you are not proud of your cellar, there is no thrill of satisfaction in seeing your guest hold up his wine glass to the light and look judicial. Such joys are reserved for conscious merit. Hence, Mr. Bulstrode's close attention was not agreeable to the publicans and sinners in Middlemarch. It was attributed by some to his being a Pharisee, and by others to his being evangelical. Less superficial reasons among them, uh, less superficial reasoners among them, wished to know who his father and grandfather were, observing that five and twenty years ago nobody had ever heard of Bulstrode in Middlemarch. So we're going to stop again because. We've got some anti-Semitism to talk about. So, uh, yeah. <sighs> what do we do with that, right? So we've got, this, uh, we've got this description. We have a character who's called a Pharisee, and the Pharisees um, are often, especially in, even, in, in, in current evangelical circles, and evangelicalism today is not the same as the evangelicalism of the 19th century. I mean, they're, they're related. They're not unknown to each other. But what we have now in evangelicalism is uh, capitalistic Christianity. And that's not necessarily what evangelicalism was in the 19th century. Um, so this banker is called a Pharisee. So he's around money and it, there appears to be a rumor going around that he might be Jewish because no one's heard of him. And, and all of this is absolutely, um, if you're not comfortable calling it racist, that's between you and your conscience. Uh, but you can certainly call, what's the other word that we can use? I mean, uh, there's a prejudice there that was common enough and understood enough that you could just say mysterious background, as we heard in an earlier chapter about Bolstrode. And, uh, you know, make little hints, uh, wealthy as a Jew, <laughs> and calling him a Pharisee, to, and, and none of these are, none of these are or nice terms. You, you're not being complimented when uh, someone refers to you in that way. So again, you will have people who will say time and place, we have to take this in its context. And we can absolutely take it in its context. And it's still not great. Do we cancel George Eliot? She, she did it for us. She went ahead and died and good for her. And uh, someday we all will get that opportunity. And maybe that involves getting to talk to George Eliot afterwards and she can explain herself to you and it may make no sense or it may make all the sense. I don't know, I've never talked to her. But what we can't do is we can't say this was unknowing antisemitism. This is very knowing antisemitism and it's in this book and it's not super great. You can love this book. You can absolutely love this book. You do have to be prepared to uh, talk about, not defensively and not argumentatively, but you do need to be prepared to talk about these moments in the book. 
and, and, and you need to maybe stop and put the book down for a second and think about what's being said and why it's being said and why that was such easy shorthand. And what are we doing? Like, what is our shorthand today? It's still Jews, by the way. Um, but, you know, what we keep, we keep trying to find the least powerful minority group to use as a slander. And then as soon as that minority group gets some power or gets some attention or, or whatever, then people start saying, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should not use um, the Lapushian as a slur. But they're slurs and, and, and that's what they are. And, the, and they're meant to demean and call into question the integrity and for the Victorian, certainly the morality of that character. So it may happen more. We'll talk about it when it comes up. Uh, to his present visitor, Lydgate, the scrutinizing look was a matter of indifference. He simply formed an unfavorable opinion of the banker's constitution and concluded that he had an eager inward life with little enjoyment of tangible things. So this is also something to pay attention to. Um, authors will sort of clue us in on who to trust and who not to trust. And so if you get the opinion, if you're presented with a character like, like Lydgate, who is a man of science, who's a young man, uh, who seems to be um, of good character. I was going to say of good stock, but ugh. I'll have a cup of eugenics, please. But if Lydgate doesn't like Bolstrode, that means something. And we're supposed to understand something. And what I'm telling you, or what I'm asking you to do, as a reader or a listener, is don't let an author's um, like of a character influence how you see other characters. Just see them as they are, listen to their words. And again, I mean, those are influenced by the author, absolutely. So in some sense, you are getting something of the author. The author is using those terms um, to convey a message or to um, make an argument, but they're there, and 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 they're there, they're there for you to work with. Reading is not um, reading should never be you on a beach with a book you don't care that just moves along. I take it back. I do love. I love any novel. I love anything by Michael Crichton. I will read. I will hate every moment of it, but I will read it and read it and read it and love it. Uh, so there is something to that. Forget everything I said about that. But I think some books do require you to be more present while you're reading them. Um, it's sort of like, it's the difference between uh, sitting down and watching something on television and sitting down and scrolling through your phone while the television is on and you sort of get the gist of it and that's enough. And there are some books that you just need the gist of. This isn't a gist of book. This is, we, we've got to be aware through it. Uh, I shall be exceedingly obliged if you will look in on me here occasionally, Mr. Lydgate, the banker observed after a brief pause. If, as I dare to hope, I have the privilege of finding you a valuable coagitator in the interesting matter of hospital management, there will be many questions which we shall need to discuss in private. As to the new hospital, which is nearly finished, I shall consider what you have said about the advantages of the special destination for fevers. The decision will rest with me, for though Lord Mel Medlicott has given the land and timber for the building, he is not disposed to give his personal attention to the, to the object. There are a few things better worth the pains in a provincial town 
There are few things better worth the pains in a provincial town like this, said Lydgate. A fine fever hospital, in addition to the old infirmary, might be the nucleus of a medical school here, when once we get our medical reforms. And what would do more for medical education than the spread of such schools over the country? A born provincial man who has a grain of public spirit, as well as a few ideas, should do what he can to resist the rush of everything that is a little better than common towards London. Any valid profession, aim, any valid professional aims may often find a freer, if not a richer field in the provinces. Hi, it's me again. I want to talk a little bit about, and just a little bit, because I don't know, I'm not, I'm not your best expert. I am uh, just an enthusiast. <laughs> but um, one of the things that are, that, that's happening is there's a lot of vivisection going on in the 19th century. And vivisection is um, cutting into uh, animals while they're still alive to see how things work. And 19th century doctors learned a lot, but they learned it in a cruel way. So a question that I think um, that is worth working through is at what cost are we healthy? Like what sacrifices were made by sentient beings because I believe that animals have lives and desires and all the things that we have, they just perform them in a way that we don't recognize. And since we don't recognize it, we don't honor it. And that is a huge failing on the part of human beings. We are a mistake. <laughs> we should. That, like, if we have to be here, maybe consciousness was not the best thing for us or not using it in, in helpful ways. So this, this um, hospital that's going up that could turn into a teaching hospital is going to have a lot of terrible stuff happening to it. Eventually, England will pass this act against vivisection. There's a bonkers book by Wilkie Collins uh, called Heart and Science, and it has a mad vivisectionist in it. And um, just a lot of it would be a B movie. Like if, if some, if it were made today, it would be a B movie melodrama. It's absolutely filled with um, really unfortunate um, caricatures of uh, disabled people and of uh, mental illness, and but it is. <laughs> Do I recommend it? Absolutely, I recommend it. Just no going in, you got to do some work. But it is, it's a wonderful Wilkie Collins book. It's very short. One of Lydgate's gifts, one of Lydgate's gifts was a voice habitually deep and sonorous, which I as I say in my deepest voice. That was not sonorous at all, was it? Yet capable of becoming very low and gentle at the right moment. About his ordinary bearing, there was a certain fling, a fearless expectation of success. He's white. A confidence in his own powers, very white. An integrity much fortified by contempt for petty obstacles or seductions of which he had no experience. But this proud openness was made lovable by an expression of unaffected goodwill. Mr. Bulstrode perhaps liked him the better for the difference between them in pitch and manners. He certainly liked him the better, as Rosamond did, for being a stranger in Middlemarch. One can begin so many things with a new person, even begin to be a better man. So that's interesting. I say that a lot, don't I? interesting but I think it is interesting that's why I'm doing this um Bolstrode sees Lydgate as someone who is also not a middle marcher and um can possibly help 
take away some of the patina of mystery on Bolstrode that uh, makes him a complicated character to trust in Middlemarch. And by character, I don't mean character in the book, but I mean like a, if Middlemarch, let's pretend Middlemarch exists in this way. Um, he wants something to boost him up. There's a similar plot point in The House of Mirth, where Lily Bart is um, proposed to by a Jewish financier, and uh, he uh, doesn't, he has money. What he needs is her position to sort of raise him up. So, I mean, Edith Wharton was, she was best friends with Henry James, and I think that says a lot about who Edith Wharton was. I love her writing. I think The Age of Innocence is an amazing book. I think um, The House of Mirth, also very good. Um, oh, and you should absolutely read The Custom of the Country. If you, like me, are a homosexual male who loves wicked women, oh, you're gonna have a good time with Custom of the Country. Let's get back to Middlemarch. I shall rejoice to furnish your zeal with fuller opportunities, Mr. Bolstrode answered. I mean, by confiding to you that it's who, by confiding to you the superintendents of my new hospital, should a mature knowledge favor that issue, for I am determined that so great an object shall not be shackled by our two physicians. Indeed, I am encouraged to consider your advent to this town as a gracious indication that a more manifest blessing is now to be awarded to my efforts which have hitherto been much withstood. Hold on one second. The cat is making a distress noise. I'm gonna go check on it. Everything's fine. Um, one of the reasons that the bed doesn't have, the bed spread on it is because little baby Fosco uh, came in, threw up everywhere and then left. So I had to wash it. And then I heard more cat noises. And if you're a cat owner, you know the noise that I'm talking about. And I thought, oh, and uh, it's fine. Somebody just needed a little bit of attention. So all is well. I'm not promising that it's going to stay well, but I am promising to pick up where I left off. <sighs> Let's start that paragraph over. I shall rejoice to furnish your zeal with fuller opportunities, Mr. Bolstrode answered. I mean, by confiding to you the superintendence of my new hospital, should a, should a mature knowledge favor that issue. For I am determined that so great an object shall not be shackled by our two physicians. Um, so something uh, that isn't footnoted in the Norton Critical Edition, but I will footnote for you, is, um, so Middlemarch is two older doctors who are using older methods and there is a fight often, um, both in literature and then actually uh, actual fights between uh, these new doctors like Lydgate and these old timey doctors uh, like the two in Middlemarch. And what's interesting is how that gets uh, represented in art. In some cases, you know, the new doctor comes along and his new ways are much better for the community and everybody does, does well. And uh, the older practitioners are treated as uh, money sponges, uh, Jews, we'll call them Jews. And uh, we won't do that. But um, you also see the other way where some new doctor comes in with all these new methods and the methods are actually hurting people and the older ways are better. So there's continually been this conflict between um, what gets called medicine and, and what gets called healthcare and, and, and what is legitimate and what isn't. And it's a, it's a mess, it's a problem. It's not dealt well, it's not dealt with well in literature, but we don't, deal well with it in real life, so. Indeed, I am encouraged to consider your advent to this town as a gracious indication that a more manifest blessing is now to be awarded to my efforts, which have hitherto been 
much withstood. With regard to the old infirmary, we have gained the initial point, I mean your election, and now I hope you will not shrink from incurring a certain amount of jealousy and dislike from your professional brethren by presenting yourself as a reformer. Oh, I will not profess bravery, said Lydgate, smiling, but I acknowledge a good deal of pleasure in fighting. I should not care for my profession if I did not believe that better methods were to be found and enforced there as well as everywhere else. The standard of that profession is low in Middlemarch, my dear sir, said the banker. I mean in knowledge and skill, not in social status, for our medical men are most of them connected with respectable town pe townspeople here. My own sources, which the divine mercy has placed within our reach, wait, my own imperfect health has induced me to give some attention to these palliative resources which the divine mercy has placed within our reach. I have consulted eminent men in the metropolis, and I am painfully aware of the backwardness under which medical treatment labors in our provincial districts. So this is a novel that sees. Well, let's be careful there, Mike. Bolstrode, um, who we are clued into, may not be great based on George Eliot's algebra here, um, but we're just being told what he's like. Um, he sounds like one of those people. He sounds, A, very satisfied with himself and uh, sees all of this as testament to his good doing and doesn't necessarily see it as a communal good, but something that uh, will bring him uh, higher up in Middlemarch society and get him further away from whatever his mysterious past is. He's a Jew. Um, my husband is Jewish is a thing I might say he is. He also isn't because he was raised Jewish and Catholic, but he's technically Jewish because his mother is um, a Huberman. So, but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't give me permission. I'm just, yeah. Why did I tell you that? Just to get to know me. Uh, the standard of that profession is low in Middlemarch, my dear sir, said the banker. I mean, I mean in knowledge and skill, not on social status. For our medical men are most of them connected with respectable townspeople here. My own imperfect health has induced me to give some attention to those palliative resources which the divine mercy has placed within our reach. I have consulted eminent men in the metropolis and I am painfully aware of the backwardness under which medical treatment labors in our provincial districts. Yes, with our present medical rules and education, one must be satisfied now and then to meet with a fair practitioner. As to, all the, as to all the higher questions which determine the starting point of the diagnosis, as to the philosophy of medical evidence, any glimmering of these can only come from a scientific culture of which country practitioners have usually no more notion than the man in the moon. So let's keep that in the back of our head that Lydgate had that speech. That was Lydgate speaking because he is, uh, he is discounting folk medicine and he is elevating what we would call Western medicine. Um, and that isn't necessarily true. That, 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 um, that doesn't always bear out. Medicine is complicated. Science is what we want it to be in America. Mr. Bolstrode, bending and looking intently, found the form which Lydgate had given to his agreement not quite suited to his comprehension. Under such circumstances, a judicious man changes the topic and enters on ground where his own gifts may be more useful. I am aware, he said, that the peculiar bias of medical ability is towards material means. Nevertheless, Mr. Lydgate, I hope we shall not vary in sentiment as to a measure in which you are not likely to be actively concerned, but in which your sympathetic concurrence may be an aid to me. You recognize, I hope, the existence of spiritual interests in your patients? Certainly I do, but those words are apt to cover different meanings to different minds. Precisely. 
And on such subjects, wrong teaching is as fatal as no teaching. Now, a point which I have much at heart to secure is a new regulation. Let's try that again, precisely. And on such subjects, wrong teaching is as fatal as no teaching. Now, a point which I have much at heart to secure is a new regulation as to clerical attendance at the old infirmary. The building stands in Mr. Fairbrother's parish. You know Mr. Fairbrother. I have seen him. He gave me his vote. I must call to thank him. He seems a very bright, pleasant little fellow, and I understand he is a naturalist. So a uh, naturalist or um, what is it? a natural philosopher, uh, they didn't have the term scientist. So naturalist is just someone who goes out and uh, keeps things in jars until they die. I'm grossly understating what a naturalist was. But um, yeah, that if you are a naturalist, you spent your time collecting specimens uh, and, it, and seriously doing unspeakable things to animals big and small. In, the, in this quest for knowledge that humans believe they have a right to. Um, and that's something I think I should probably think about a little bit longer. This um, very homo sapien leaning idea that humans have to know everything. And maybe we don't have to know everything. I don't know. I am not a scientist. I am simply a sweaty, sweaty, it is so hot here, you all, because um, because the sun and because it's summer and it's July and I've got a sheen. Let's see. Mr. Fairbrother, my dear, Mr. Fairbrother, my dear sir, is a man deeply painful to, com to contemplate. I suppose there is not a clergyman in the Count in the country who has greater talents, Mr. Bolstrode paused and looked meditative. I have not yet been pained by finding an excessive talent in Middlemarch, said Lydgate bluntly. I don't think I like Lydgate all that much so far. We'll see. What I desire. Mr. Bolstrode continued, looking still more serious, is that Mr. Fairbrother's attendance at the hospital should be superseded by the appointment of a chaplain, of Mr. Tyke, in fact, and that no other spiritual aid should be called in. Now that is, huh, this doesn't sound like a reputable hospital. And why is a banker running a hospital? There's a lot of questions left unanswered in these pages that I would want explored. Um, let's see. As a medical man, I could have no opinion on such a point unless I knew Mr. Tyke, and even then I should require to know the cases in which he was applied. Lydgate smiled, but he was bent on being circumspect. Of course, you cannot fully enter into the merits of his measure at present, but here Mr. Bolstrode began to speak with a more chiseled emphasis. The subject is likely to be referred to the medical board of the infirmary. And what I trust I may ask of you is that in virtue of the cooperation between us, which I now look forward to, you will not, so far as you are concerned, be influenced by my opponents in this matter. Yeah, Bolstrobe does not sound like a good guy. Lydgate also does not sound like a good guy. I think he's supposed to be a good guy, but oh, I would not want to hang out with that. I would not invite him to dinner. I hope I shall have nothing to do with clerical disputes, said Lydgate. The path I have chosen is to work well in my own profession. My responsibilities, Mr. Lydgate, is of a broader kind. With me, indeed, this question is one of sacred accountableness, whereas with my opponents, I have good reason to say that it is an occasion for gratifying a spirit of worldly opposition. But I shall not therefore drop one iota of my convictions or cease to identify myself with that truth, which an evil generation hates. 
I have devoted myself to this object of hospital improvement, but I will boldly confess to you, Mr. Lydgate, that I should have no interest in hospitals if I believed that nothing more was concerned therein than the cure of mortal diseases. Oh, let's read that sentence just one more time. I should have no interest in hospitals if I believed that nothing more was concerned therein than the cure of mortal diseases. I have another ground of action, and in the face of persecution, I will not conceal it. Mr. Bolstrode's voice had become a loud and agitated whisper as he said the last words, which I didn't do because I'm not an actor. Are we close to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, three more pages. Uh, th there we, we certainly differ. I wonder if this would be better. There we certainly differ, said Lydgate, but he was not sorry that the door was now open and Mr. Vincey was announced. That florid sociable personage was becoming more interesting to him since he had seen Rosamond. Not that, not that man naturally remember, not that, like her, he had been weaving any future in which their lots were united, but a man naturally remembers a charming girl with pleasure and is willing to dine where he may see her again. Before he took leave, Mr. Vincey had given that invitation which he had been in no hurry about for Rosamond at breakfast had mentioned that she thought her uncle Featherston had taken the new doctor into great favor. Mr. Bolstrode alone with his brother-in-law poured himself out a glass of water and opened a sandwich box. I cannot persuade you to adopt my regimen, Vincy. No, no, I have no opinion of that system. Life wants padding. I love that line, life wants padding said Mr. Vincey, unable to omit his portable theory. <laughs> However, he went on, accenting the word as if to dismiss all irrelevance, what I came here to talk about was a little affair of my young scapegrace friends. This is a subject on which you and I are likely to take quite as different views as on diet, Vincey. Well, I hope not this time. Mr. Vincey was resolved to be good-humored. The fact is, it's about a whim of old Featherston's. Somebody has been cooking up a story out of spite and telling it to the old man to try to set him against Fred. He's very fond of Fred and is likely to do something handsome for him. Indeed, he has as good as told Fred that he means to leave him his land and that makes other people jealous. Vincy. I must repeat that you will not get any concurrence from me as to the course you have pursued with your eldest son. It was entirely from worldly vanity that you destined him for the church with a family of three sons and four daughters. You were not warranted in devoting money to an expensive education which has succeeded in nothing but in giving him extravagant idle habits. You are now reaping the consequences. Spoken like a banker. To point out other people's errors was a duty that Mr. Bulstrode rarely shrank from, <laughs> but Mr. Vincey was not equally prepared to be patient. When a man has the immediate prospect of being mayor and is ready in the interests of commerce to take up a firm attitude on politics generally, he has naturally a sense of his importance to the framework of things, which seems to throw questions of private conduct into the background. And this particular reproof irritated him more than any other. It was eminently superfluous to him to be told that he was reaping the consequences. But he felt his neck under Bolstrode's yoke, and though he usually enjoyed kicking, he was anxious to refrain from that relief. As to that, Bolstrode, it's no use going back. I'm not one of your pattern men, and I don't pretend to be. I couldn't foresee everything in the trade. There wasn't a finer business in Middlemarch than ours, and the lad was clever. My poor brother was in the church and would have done well. Had got preferment already, but that stomach fever took him off, else he might have been a dean by that time. By this time, I think I was justified in what I tried to do for Fred. If you come to religion, it seems to me a man shouldn't want to carve out his meat to an ounce beforehand. 
one must trust a little to Providence and be generous. It's a good British feeling to try and raise your family a little, in my opinion. To try, no, no. It's a good British feeling to try and raise your family a little, in my opinion. It's a father's duty to give his sons a fine chance. There's an interesting American novel called The Magnificent Ambersons. Spoiler alert, they're not magnificent, but it sort of um, lays out kind of the timeline of wealth in a family. So that first, the first generation, first man, as we're talking about olden time. So the, the, the man that makes a success of himself and has a family uh, raises children who, sees, who will see the hard work that he has done and will uh, strive to, to, to keep up with their father. So that second generation is children, and they want to make sure that those children don't have to work as hard as they did to maintain their father, or in the case of that third generation grandfather's, dream. So wealth, wealth, and then squander tends to be the trajectory um, for a lot of families who have money and who get money from uh, some sort of hard work. And, and you have these empires that eventually a child comes along who has no interest in logging or I just read Bark Skins. Uh, the series is weird, by the way. It doesn't follow the book. It's very soapy. I'm not recommending it. Will people even know what Bark Skins is in the future? Probably not. Let's keep going with Middlemarch. Um, I don't wish to act otherwise than as your best friend, Vincy, when I say that what you have been uttering just now is one mass of worldliness and inconsistent folly. Very well, said Mr. Vincy, kicking in spite of resolutions. I never profess to be anything but worldly, and what's more, I don't see anybody else who is not worldly. I suppose you don't conduct business on what you call unworldly principles. The only difference I see is that one worldliness is a little bit honester than the other. This kind of discussion is unfruitful, Vincy, said Mr. Bolstrode, who, finishing his sandwich, had thrown himself back in his chair and shaded his eyes as if weary. You had some more practical, you had some more particular business. Yes. Yes, the long and short of it is somebody has told old Featherston, giving you as the authority, that Fred has been borrowing or trying to borrow stuff, either of his having, nope, nope, <laughs> has been borrowing or trying to borrow money on the prospect of his land. Of course you never said any such nonsense, but the old fellow will insist on it that Fred should bring him a denial in your handwriting. That is, just a bit of a note saying you don't believe a word of such stuff, either of his having borrowed or tried to borrow in such a fool's way. I suppose you can have no objection to do that. Pardon me, I do have an objection. I am by no means sure that your son, in his recklessness and ignorance, I will use no severer words, has not tried to raise money by holding out his future prospects, or even that someone may not have been foolish enough to supply him on so vague a presumption. There is plenty of such lax money lending as of other folly in the world. But Fred gives me his honor that he has never borrowed money on the pretense of any understanding about his uncle's land. He is not a liar. I don't want to make him better than he is. I have blown him, I've blown him up well. Nobody can say I wink at what he does, but he is not a liar. And I should have thought, but I may be wrong, that there was no religion to hinder a man from believing the best of a young fellow when you don't know worse. It seems to me it would be a poor sort of religion to put a spoke in his wheel by refusing to say you don't believe such harm of him as you've got no good reason to believe. I am not sure at all. I'm not at all sure that I should be befriending your son by smoothing his way to the future possession of Featherston's property. I cannot regard wealth as a blessing to those who use it simply as a harvest for this world. 
You do not like to hear these things, Vincy, but on this occasion I feel called upon to tell you that I have no motive for furthering such a disposition of property as that which you refer to. I do not shrink from saying that it will not tend to your son's eternal welfare or to the glory of God. Why then should you expect me to pen this kind of affidavit which has no object but to keep up a foolish partiality and secure a foolish bequest? If you mean to hinder everybody from having money but saints and evangelists, you must give up some profitable partnerships. That's all I can say, Mr. Vincey burst out very bluntly. It may be for the glory of God, but it's not for the glory of the Middlemarch trade that Plymdale's house, Plymdale's house uses those blue and green dyes it gets from the brassing manufactory. They rot the silk. That's all I know about it. Perhaps, it um, perhaps if other people knew so much of the profit went to the glory of God, they might like it better. But I don't mind so much about that. I would get up a pretty row if I chose. Mr. Bolstrode paused a little before he answered. You pain me very much by speaking in this way, Vincy. I do not expect you to understand my grounds of action. It is not an easy thing even to thread a path for principles and the intricacies of the world, still less to make the thread clear for the careless and the scoffing. You must remember, if you please, that I stretch my tolerance towards you as my wife's brother, and that it will become and that it little becomes you to complain of me as a withholding material help towards a worldly position of your family. I must remind you that it is not your own prudence or judgment that has enabled you to keep your place in the trade. They are claws out with this. Very likely not, but you have been no loser by my trade yet, said Mr. Vincey, thoroughly nettled, the result which was seldom much retarded by previous resolutions. Uh, retarded in the, not the bad way that we use it today, but slowed down in its 19th century context. So in that case, we can say that word was not meant in the way that it's meant today. Uh, George Eliot is not using a slur there. She does use them other places. Um, And when you married Harriet, I don't see how you could expect that our family should not hang by the same nail. If you've changed your mind and want my family to come down on the world, you'd better say so. I've never changed. I'm a plain churchman now, just as I used to be before. Docu uh, just, just, blah, 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 blah. I'm a plain churchman now, just as, just as I used to be before. What? Oh, there we go. Hi. Sometimes when you get older, sentences move around. I'm a plain churchman now, just as I used to be before doctrines came up. I take the world as I find it, in trade and everything else. I'm contented to be no worse than my neighbors. But if you want us to come down in the world, say so. I shall know better what to do then. You talk unreasonably. Shall you come down in the world for want of this letter about your son? Well, whether or not I consider it very unhandsome of you to refuse it. Oh, sorry. Well, whether or not I consider it very unhandsome of you to refuse it. Such doings may be lined with religion, but outside they have a nasty dog in the manger look. You might as well slander Fred. It comes pretty near to, to it when you refuse to say you didn't set a slander going. It's this sort of thing, this tyrannical spirit wanting to play bishop and banker everywhere. It's this sort of thing makes a man's name stink. Vincy, if you insist on quarreling with me, it will be exceedingly painful to Harriet as well as myself, said Mr. Bolstrode, with a trifle more eagerness and paleness than usual. I don't want to quarrel. It's for my interest and, and perhaps for yours too that we should be friends. I bear you no grudge. I make no worse of you than I do of other people. A man who half starves himself and goes the length in family prayers and so on, that you do, believes in his religion, whatever it may be. You could turn over your capital just as fast with cursing and swearing, plenty of fellows do. 
You like to be master, there's no denying that. You must be first chop in heaven, else you won't like it much. But you're my sister's husband, and we ought to stick together. And if I know Harriet, she'll consider it your fault if we quarrel, because you strain at a gnat in this way, and refuse to do Fred a good turn. And I don't mean to say I shall bear it well. I consider it unhandsome. Mr. Vincey rose, began to button his greatcoat, and looked steadily at his brother-in-law, meaning to imply a demand for a decisive answer. This was not the first time that Mr. Bolstrode had been, had begun by admonishing Mr. Vincey, and it ended by seeing a very unsatisfactory reflection of himself in the coarse, unflattering mirror which that manufacturer's mind presented to the subtler lights and shadows of his fellow men, of his fellow men. And perhaps his experience ought to have warned him how the scene would end. But a fulfilled fountain will be generous with its water, even in the rain, when they are worse than useless. And a fine fount of admonition is apt to be equally irrepressible. It was not in Mr. Bulstrode's nature to comply directly in consequence of uncomfortable suggestions. Before changing his course, he always needed to shape his motives and bring them into accordance with his habitual standard. He said at last, I will reflect a little, Vincy. I will mention the subject to Harriet. I shall probably send you a letter. Very well. As soon as you can, please. I hope it will be settled before I see you tomorrow. And that ends chapter 13. We did it. Chapter 14. How long are we together when I get to, oh, well, it's also, okay. We're getting back to, I, I'm sure I can do this one tomorrow. Oh, well, I can't. The next three days um, are really busy for me at work because we're doing a virtual conference. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to tell you? Not that I can think of. Just, um, I really like, uh, I really like this project. I like making these connections and sharing them. Um, and I think maybe some of them are wrong. And I hope that somebody uh, says something because I don't always want to live in error. Does my one eye look less alive than the other? Okay, you don't need to watch me do that. This has been Footnotes with Mike Bevel. We are reading Middlemarch. We're nowhere close to done. And I hope to, yeah, I did that thing where I had to look to see where the stop button was. I hope to see you soon. And uh, we'll just keep trucking along. Goodbye.